So let's see. Um, first of all, I'd like to get a, a quick sense of who you are and what your interest is. Uh, so, Sarah, I've been. I give this uh, similar talk in a lot of different venues, so it's a, a interesting test. Is there anybody who uh, is primarily a health person here? As I expected, yeah. Um, but it's interesting talking to uh, people from medicine about games and the kinds of expectations and you know preconceptions that they have. Uh, and has anyone shipped games for health or you know similar sort of game medical crossover? Interesting. All right. Well, hopefully I can uh, change your minds about whether that's worthwhile. And um, I, I, the last question is probably self-evident, so I'm going to pass on that one. So I have uh, an unusual background. Uh, part of it is just that I've been in the games industry since 1980 and uh, done a lot of different things, started as, as most of us did at that point as a programmer and found early on that I preferred design. Uh, although I just want to point out that back in uh, the time I started, it took me two and a half years before I actually met somebody who was a full-time game designer because that seemed like a, a silly concept. You know, what, what good is it to design games if you can't actually program them? So I'm glad things have changed. Uh, but part of my career has been at big companies. I was one of the first few people at, at LucasArts uh, as well as uh, DreamWorks Interactive that, that became EALA. Uh, I was with Google for... Uh, four years up until about a year and a half ago. And the rest of the time, uh, actually most of the last 20 years, except for the Google time, I've been a, a freelancer and working mostly doing design, sometimes being a producer and starting up projects. And over that time, I started to find more and more opportunities that uh, blended games and neuroscience and medicine and health in different ways. And I'll be talking about you know, some of my own personal background just to, to give you a sense of what's happened with that part of the industry today. And that bottom row that you see there, I'll, I'll go into a few of those of some of the uh, health or, or in some cases more health and education oriented stuff that's gone on. Uh, as I talk about this stuff, a couple things to keep in mind. I'm definitely not a medical expert, and I am, a, you know, like a lot of uh, game developers, are a real science nerd and love finding out about neuroscience in particular. And, you know, I think that figuring out what's going on in our brains while we're playing games and while the uh, players of our games are reacting to them is part of what makes a, a good game designer. Uh, but anything that sounds like medical expertise, you should take with a grain of salt because it's all stuff that I've had to learn uh, pretty much on my own recently. And this is a pretty short overview of a lot of information. What I'm giving you is really the tip of the iceberg. And I've been lucky to work on a lot of really interesting crossover products between games and health. But there are many, many more that uh, I haven't uh, had time to, to put on these slides here. And I will be talking about several companies that I uh, am working with currently. It's another interesting contrast on the medical side of things. They have really strict ethical laws about you know, disclosing every last detail about who may be giving you money and that sort of thing. And the games industry is a little bit more lax about that. But I'm not uh, pushing any of these companies. And you know, given that nobody here is already doing this sort of work, it probably is uh, irrelevant that way anyway. Um, so, I'll be talking about the Games for Health as it has been and as it is now and how that's changing. Uh, I'll be talking about why I think that this is a really interesting area for game developers to get into. In particular, if any of you have been feeling squeezed, uh, mobile developers or console developers that feel like the field is so crowded now, you know, or maybe you went to, to uh, VR and it didn't you know, sell as many headsets as you expected, uh, you know, that sort of thing. I really think this is an area that's going to grow very, very quickly. Uh, in fact, in the last year, it already has been. And I'll be talking about FDA clearance. That's the, the Food and Drug Administration in the US, but it tends to be a uh, standard by which a lot of the world pharmaceutical industry measures uh, efficacy and, and uh, validity. So I think it really uh, is significant whether or not you're planning on, on working with uh, American uh, uh, companies. Uh, 
And uh, finally, I'll, I'll be getting into a deeper dive about you know how you can actually get into medicine and games and some of the advantages and disadvantages of what an FDA clearance means and why that's not necessarily the best path for everybody to, to follow. But the core thing is, why should you care about you know health you know with games? I mean, besides uh, trying something new, you know, isn't this just another odd kind of niche? And one of the things that I've learned in the games industry is that if you don't love new things and exploring new areas, then this is probably a really bad industry for you to be in because things are changing all the time. And I, you know, I have friends who started out making uh, text adventures. Uh, some of those early games I programmed uh, were for the Atari VCS on a cartridge that had 2K bytes of uh, memory for everything. That was for the code for the game, including graphics, sound, 2,048 bytes, uh, or you know, we actually would look at it one bit at a time at that point because we really needed to. The kinds of skills you need to cram stuff into a cartridge like that are quite different than what you need for you know a cutting edge uh, game today. Uh, and if you don't really want to learn anything new, you're going to get outdated in this this industry very quickly. Lots of times I look at it as these new vistas open up. You know, I mentioned VR. I really believe in VR in the long term, but it's been a little slow to take off. You know, other things kind of happen upon us when uh, mobile phone games. I had several friends in the, the 90s and, and uh, early uh, 2000s who had mobile phone game companies that almost all went out of business because the, the state-of-the-art phone just wasn't capable of very much. And finally, when smartphones came around, there was the explosion that we've all seen you know, before it got saturated. So it's a little bit like going through this little mountain pass, and maybe it's going to be a little cul-de-sac. Maybe it'll be a fertile valley, and you have some time before it's used up. Sometimes it's a whole new continent. And the real question is, how does Games for Health fit in? Because so far, it's been a pretty small area. Well, there are three basic reasons why I think game developers should be interested in this. One of the first most fundamental ones is that we're actually, when we make Games for Health, we're helping people in really direct ways. I mean, I, I have a lot of... Uh, belief in the value of entertainment in its own sake. Uh, there's a wonderful old movie from the 1940s called Sullivan's Progress, uh, Sullivan's Travels, excuse me, that I would recommend if you're curious about what's important about entertainment. Even though it's a dated, you know, old movie, it has a lot that hasn't changed in, you know, 70 plus years. Um, but what I'm showing you here, actually, uh, that picture on the screen, is uh, something that I learned last year that really impressed me. At the um, Stanford Children's Hospital, there was a Dr. Sam Rodriguez who's experimenting with using VR for pain remediation and distraction from uh, acute pain, which is like, in this particular case, was a boy who had burns over a large part of his body. And he was under treatment, but every time they had to change the bandages, it hurt him so much that he would panic, and they had to give him uh, medication and, and you know, increasingly powerful opioids and things that are really scared about giving to a young kid like this. And Dr. Rodriguez had this program, uh, luckily, where he was being treated, where they had developed not only a VR game that was meant to distract you in these cases, but it was Gear VR and it was controlled totally by head tilt. So as you can see, his arms and hands are bandaged. There's no way he could hold a game controller, but he could play this game simply by lying in bed, tilting his head, and he was actually seeing a sort of a toboggan run. And the amazing thing about this is that the first time they tried this, he went from the place where he was actually needing the maximum allowable dosage of these drugs in order to even have the bandages changed and still getting panicked at that point to being able to do this without drugs at all just with the VR headset. And you know, it's certainly not scientific to look at this one data point, but that kind of dramatic change, I think, shows you the power of games and how wonderful it is to think that this game wasn't just entertaining the kid, but helping him through what hopefully would be you know, one of the hardest parts of his life. Um, another thing is that this is a really interesting challenge. Uh, any of you who may be successful in what you're doing already, but getting a little bored with doing you know, yet another first-person shooter or match three game or any of the genres that have been mined over and over again and yet are still worthwhile so people keep having you do them, 
Games for Health is really uh, challenging. It's you, everything you've learned about making a game fun still applies to Games for Health. And yet you also have this huge burden of trying to make it work for the medical purposes. And if you entertain someone, but it doesn't actually do what it needs to, so for example, if that previous game had been fun, but not so much fun that he didn't notice the pain, it doesn't matter that you're enjoying yourself, you, know, you failed. And so it's a really tough project to try and match the medical needs of things and the, the medical needs change considerably from one project to another and still use everything you've learned about uh, game development, but it's very um, interesting and it's, it's a more diverse uh, range of kinds of uh, production that you have to do as well as an extremely diverse group of people who are working on this sort of thing. The, the medical community has a very different uh, look than the game development community and it's been really interesting and refreshing to kind of blend those two together. And the third one is the simple uh, financial reason that this is a, a huge potential market. Uh, the size of that market, you can see, you know, it's a, a worldwide uh, pharmaceutical market for uh, a couple of years ago. That 900 mark, uh, that's not $900 million, that's $900 billion annually worldwide spent on pharmaceuticals. Uh, North America is the largest market, but as you can see, Europe is very close behind that. We're talking about, uh, in North America, about a, a $300 billion a year industry. Now, games are not going to obviously take over for drugs for everything. But even if it only hit a few percent, that would be incredibly significant. In fact, as big as uh, local markets in these areas for the entire mobile game market, for example, just when you hit, I think, three or four percent. And I think we have the potential to go beyond that percentage as well, because games are very effective for a whole range of things. And I'm just realizing my timer never started. So um, let me make sure I've got, OK. So, what's the catch? Why shouldn't everybody be doing this? Well, I talked about you, this, this new pass opens up into a new valley, and isn't this wonderful? And all too often, game developers end up in a place like this. Uh, there are actually quite a few uh, VR developers, and I, again, I'm not bashing VR, but it's a great example. I have a feeling there may be some blockchain game developers who will be in this position soon of, they promised me this great new area, I can see it spreading out before me, but why is nobody actually playing these games or buying these headsets and you know, how do we get to that point? And sometimes it's just a matter of time, you know, as I mentioned my friends with those mobile game companies you know, in uh, 2003, they just held on a little bit longer, things would get better, but sometimes they don't. And finding out whether this is just a, a, a tip of a, a, a you know interesting area that you can't ever get into, or you know a really wonderful new continent to explore, can be a little difficult. Uh, give you some examples. Uh, the first game that I worked on in this general category was way back in 1999, and it was an attempt at one of the first uh, commercial uh, for for. Um, uh, consumer uh, EEG headsets and uh, that low resolution picture is because in 1999 that was actually a high resolution picture. Um, and it was actually very uncomfortable. They, they had um, the, the electrodes that they need to pick up EEG uh, it, it can really you know, push hard into your head before they can get a good contact. And uh, the big problem was that the chief financial officer, it, it seemed like a scene from a, a bad cliche in a movie, but he ran off to the Bahamas with most of the money from the company and they weren't able to recover from that. But they were actually working with attention deficit disorder in kids and that actually is interestingly as a theme is something that uh, will be coming up quite a bit in the talk. Um, other more recent mis missteps, uh, a lot of you may remember the Wii U and, or the, the Wii and the balance board. Uh, it was actually one of the best selling peripherals of all time in the games industry. A lot of people who had the Wii went out and got this balance board and played Wii Fit and some other things. And then within weeks, almost every one of them was in a closet somewhere. And I, I think uh, a few of you probably had that experience too. Um, there's also brain training uh, around 2007 or so. This was a huge deal when Brain Age came out. Uh, and in Japan, I think there were literally something like 
uh, 50 different brain training games that were on the market around that time. Uh, Lumosity, a company that is doing that sort of thing now in the US, I was recently fined because they were promising about how brain training is doing all these wonderful things for your brain. There was actually no proof for it. So a lot of that has been difficult. But there have been a few bright spots with this as well. In fact, uh, one of the more fun things I was doing, this was back way in, it started uh, in 2001. The founder, uh, co-founder of um, uh, eBay, uh, who had you know, large personal fortune, had started Hope Lab, which is a company that actually helps uh, kids with health issues uh, through technology, including games. And they made this game called Remission. The problem was is that teens with um, uh, cancer who are on chemotherapy would stop taking their chemotherapy medicine. Not all of them, but about a, perhaps 10% of them because they had been through radiation treatment and these pills that they were still on would make them nauseous and they really hated the side effects. And being teenagers, they said, yeah, you know, I know the doctor, my parents keep saying you need to do this, it's really important, but I, I think I'm fine. And a very scary thing because you know, some of them could end up having their cancer uh, recur again. And the game was a very simple one where you're, you're flying through somebody's body. It was actually done on a pretty high budget. I think uh, they, they spent multiple millions on this back uh, in the early 2000s. And they also did a huge study on the game after it was made to see whether it was effective. And they found, in fact, that the control group, as they expected, had about 10% drop off each month for people not taking the pills. And and the ones that played the game and saw that if you missed a cancer cell in the body, it turned into two cells and four cells and eight cells. And if you didn't, if the, the, the patient whose body you were in wasn't taking chemotherapy, there were no reloads uh, for your chemotherapy gun that you're zipping around and blasting things. And it seems silly that something as simple as a game like that would actually change people's minds when a doctor telling you, you will die or you have a good chance of dying if you don't take this pill. But in fact, the tests that they showed had uh, almost rock solid uh, compliance uh, taking the chemotherapy. And this wasn't asking them, are you taking your pills? This was measuring it in their bloodstream so they knew it was actually working. And that was really exciting. Um, Skip Rizzo is a guy who's been doing a lot of interesting work, starting with some early VR, uh, and he also has been doing PTSD using modern combat games and having soldiers be able to kind of recreate some of the situations that gave them their post-traumatic stress and gradually get over it by uh, you know, increasing the level and having them cope with it. Uh, he also has been doing some really interesting work with virtual therapists and uh, also training therapists with virtual patients, so doing both sides of the, the therapy. And if any of you have tried to do virtual humans that are convincing that you can have dialogue with, you know how difficult that is. Um, other things that I think are, are looking very promising, particularly in the future, uh, eye tracking headsets. There are amazing possibilities both for gameplay and entertainment, but also for health when you can actually see exactly where someone's eyes are, are looking. And that ranges from obvious sort of vision things, uh, detecting glaucoma, uh, in fact, detecting early onset of things like Alzheimer's and Parkinson's, by the way, people's eyes move, uh, to uh, someone who is actually using uh, that picture on the, the lower right is from a, a company called Embodied Labs that is using VR headsets to train young caregivers to show what it's like to have some of the diseases of the elderly so that as they work with their elderly patients, they know what it's like firsthand. And that is simulating uh, macular degeneration when the, the front of your vision has this big black spot in it. And you have to go through a whole dinner party when, as you can see, you can't tell what you're eating or you know where the fork is going. And it turns out it's a great way of providing the empathy to see what it's like when you're in that situation. Um, the one uh, project that I've been most excited about that I was involved with was about 11 years ago, I talked to a, a Dr. Adam Ghazali, uh, who is head of brain imaging at uh, UCSF in California. And he had the idea that some of the research he was doing that was very boring, was hard to get people to do these training exercises he had for more than a few minutes before they got bored. He said, maybe we can make it into video games. And he knew a few people who, um, so one was currently at LucasArts, others had left LucasArts. And they knew that I was doing work in this area and had me come and talk to him. It's really interesting because he was very, um, 
reticent, very resistant about should he actually be, you know, incorporating games and would there be problems with people not really respecting the work and would it actually be effective. But I'm really happy that he went through with it and he has actually become kind of a superstar in this area of games for health. Um, the first thing that uh, this group did together was something called NeuroRacer and you can see a few screenshots uh, from the top there. It was a very s simple racing game done on an extremely small budget and the idea was was that aging adults get worse and worse at being able to control a car and look at signs. And they had a combination of these very simple signs like, you know, press the button when you see a green circle, but not when you see a green triangle or a red circle, that sort of thing. And you also have to stay on the road. But the thing that was intriguing to me is that it used dynamic difficulty adjustment so that on a uh, literally a second by second basis. If you're doing really well, the game gets harder. If you're having trouble, it gets easier. And it did so independently in both the driving and the sign recognition side of things and brings those two together. And it's extremely challenging, uh, but it was interesting because they were finding that they could actually train these aging adults back to the level of about 30 year olds in terms of their effectiveness. And much more exciting was that the changes that they detected in their brain with EEG, uh, six months later, about 80 or 90 percent of those changes were still there. So, and this was without continuing to play the game or do this this training. So, it made lasting changes in the brain that were uh, really helpful in, in in this area. And they went on from that to do other stuff I'll talk about in a minute. Um, so, FDA clearance. I, I'm not going to go into a, a great uh, amount of detail here um, because FDA clearance is a really difficult thing to do and I would expect uh, most of the people here from the conversations I've had in the last day or two uh, probably don't have companies that will be able to do this sort of thing. You literally need tens of millions of dollars because you have to build a team, make a game, and then lock that game down and not change it at all for uh, about two, maybe even three years while it's first tested and then goes to be submitted to the FDA and the FDA does more testing. And if it all works out at the end of that time, you can start selling the game. And if the team hasn't been paid in all that time, then you're kind of out of luck uh, with being able to do anything else. So you do need a lot of cash and there's no guarantee it'll work. But if it does work, getting a part of that $300 billion a year market is pretty exciting. So FDA tests for whether something's effective, but it really is mostly concerned about whether it's safe. They'd much rather have games, uh, sorry, drugs in most cases, but games here that are safe, but maybe not as effective as possible than, ga than drugs that might be really effective, but 10% of the people die from them. You know, it's probably not such a great trade-off. So they look at safety as the main thing, and games actually have been great in that way, um, as I'll, I'll get into in a bit. There are a lot of people working on this whole idea of, you know, instead of software as a service, software as a medical device, and sort of subscriptions to software that will help you with your health over time. And it's a really uh, interesting model. Nobody really knows how the economics of games as pharmaceuticals are going to work. There are a lot of companies looking to try this out. And the FDA, as I mentioned, is for the US, but it is the biggest single market and it tends to drive the adoption uh, in much of Europe and even in, in China and some uh, parts of Asia. They look to what the FDA has cleared as a template for what they do in their own countries. Um, it's also necessary if you want doctors to be able to prescribe games for treatment, then you need that kind of FDA clearance. And this is something that we're getting closer and closer to. And in the US, if you want it to be paid for, then the FDA also needs to approve it. So as I say, it's time consuming. It's expensive to do this. You need to raise lots of money. But quite a few companies are doing that now. And I'll get into some of that. Uh, uh, again, this is fairly probably too technical here, but um, most of the clearances they're, they're going after are type one or two clearances, which aim for less serious or less uh, consequential treatments. And uh, a lot of, lot of detail here. Um, uh, a serious uh, disease by the FDA, you don't need to read all this. The point is uh, it's best not to aim at that because you need extremely high levels of effectiveness and uh, uh, testing to, for example, uh, give somebody a drug you would take if you're in the middle of a heart attack to, to save you. Uh, I don't think pulling out a video game at that point is ever going to work very well, but we we'll never know. <laughs> 
Um, anyway, one of the companies I've been working with is a Swiss company called MindMaze. Uh, has anybody here heard of MindMaze? Oh, just one or two hands. MindMaze actually raised uh, $100 million against a billion dollar valuation just a few years ago. It's the only Swiss unicorn so far. And it's all about combining games and entertainment with uh, health technology. What you see there was their first product that actually got an FDA clearance. Um, this is uh, in, in 2017. That's their um, MindMotion Pro. In hospitals, when somebody's had a stroke, they, there's a very critical part within just the first few days after a stroke where you can start to regain a lot of your uh, mobility if you start working on it right away. And if you wait even a week, sometimes you lose that opportunity and your brain just uh, you know, loses that ability to heal. And somebody who's had a stroke and perhaps the left side of their body isn't working very well, they need to do these, these exercises that are extremely difficult for them because their, their brain cells are, are damaged from the stroke. And they, they used to have you know, a therapist saying, okay, raise your arm, okay, 20 more times, and now you know, oh, close, open and close your hand, let's do 50 of those. And people would just stop because it was difficult and it was boring. So a mind maze has made very simple games that use connect or leap motion to detect the motion of your hands and arms and make it a lot more entertaining. And they get the FDA clearance, it's being sold uh, and used in clinics throughout uh, both Europe and uh, they're spreading into different territories. Um, so they're using it for this in early in-hospital acute care where it's you know got to happen right away um, while the brain plasticity can actually uh, repair that. And in uh, June of this year, their MindMotion Go platform that is basically run, uh, runs off of a laptop was cleared for home use. So we're starting to see this. And this is a case where it, notice that it's not just the game itself will uh, fix you, but it's actually the therapy and the motion you have to go through. So this is uh, a different class than when you actually have a game that replaces things uh, completely. Another Another example of that was paratherapeutics that got their FDA clearance in 2017. And this isn't very game-like, but it's still a, a mobile uh, piece of software that helps with um, substance abuse. And it, it is used in com combination with something called cognitive behavioral therapy. Uh, and it really helped with people getting off of drugs. Um, they're talking about it as a prescription digital therapeutic, which is a great name for you know, using uh, software as a way to treat uh, medical problems. But back to that NeuroRacer uh, story, that did so well as a prototype, and they got in the journal Nature and had this big study that showed it was effective, that they were able to raise uh, some tens of millions of dollars. And I, I forget what the total that, that Achilles has done now. I think it's around 50 million. So very significant funding to start Achille Interactive Labs. Uh, this is a game to treat ADHD, uh, attention deficit and hyperactivity disorder in teens. And as you can see from the screenshot there, it, it's not just you know a, a little dot moving on a screen. This is done by a lot of game developers from you know companies you'd all recognize uh, quite a list because they've got about, uh, I think, 15 or 20 people on the development team right now. And it's essentially that same kind of racing game with uh, you know, signs coming across, but you're actually on alien planets and there are these various creatures you have to catch. So it's aimed at the, the sort of teen and tween market that this will work for. And they had a late stage trial last year that was very positive. They basically um, had 348 uh, people tested and it was as effective as Adderall and Ritalin, these very potent drugs for treating ADHD. Uh, but the side effects, instead of the kind of nausea and other problems that are, are common with some of those drugs, the two most common were occasional headaches and frustration. And they loved the fact that it was that uh, benign. And they're seeking something called de novo clearance. It's a, a new type of clearance so that doctors will say, just play this game over the course of uh, several weeks and that is just uh, as effective as taking pills. Um, they're looking for this to happen uh, within the next few months. And if that happens, you'll be seeing news about it. I think there'll be a lot more information about the idea that games can actually treat medicine. And I expect that there may be a bit of a gold rush of a lot of companies trying to say, wow, you know, this looks like we could actually get part of that uh, you know, multi-hundred billion dollar market. So it's good to be looking into this early.
But as I said, there is a long past to clearance. They did this NeuroRacer game that was done on a low budget, but then they had to uh, fund an experimental study and use EEG, and they even did some uh, functional MRI to test whether changes in the brain were actually happening and you know, were able to prove that they were. Um, let's see, I already mentioned some of this. Uh, uh, if you haven't heard of, of Dr. Ghazali, it's great to take a look. He's done uh, TED Talks, and he, he's done a bunch. Of, if if um, Hollywood had to cast somebody and create a role of a sort of rock star neuroscientist, it would be uh, Adam. Uh, he's actually gone on stage with uh, Mickey Hart, the, the drummer for the Grateful Dead, has him wear an EEG headset, and they do a light show of his brain waves while he's playing the drums as part of the, the uh, concert. So a lot of really uh, wonderful stuff there. So I said it started for research for aging adults and driving, and you can see another screenshot from that early game. Uh, but when they were able to show that it actually was effective with this multi-year study that they did, the venture capitalists were able to put up the initial, uh, I think it was something like 18 million, and they've, they've, they're up, as I said, around 50 or so now. So what's going to happen in the future? Well, I think as there are more and more of these clearances from the FDA, the ones that I mentioned that were for uh, sort of simple devices that were used in conjunction with other therapies are making it easier for Achille to get to the point of saying, yes, just playing a game can help with all sorts of uh, really important uh, medical conditions. But it is really expensive, it takes years to develop. Um, the, the big pharma companies, the, the drug manufacturers, they're powerful, but they're kind of scary to have them be a, a partner because having your game be dictated by you know, a Pfizer or some other drug company is probably going to be a very difficult process for you. And in general, it's, it's good for the financial, it's going to be good for the, the games industry, and certainly is going to help patients. And I love the idea of parents who are concerned with the, the drugs that their kids are taking for pain or for uh, attention deficit may be able to turn to games instead. Um, and there are a lot of new things, I think, that will also be uh, uh, treatable with this. Um, uh, pain beyond the acute pain that you're seeing there, chronic pain where somebody has pain all their life and they need to learn to cope with it. Games are showing a lot of promise with that. Uh, curing depression, uh, which sounds you know almost science fictional, uh, particularly doing with a video game, turns out that a lot of the cues for depression are attention related. And as uh, you know, Celia was mentioning at her talk yesterday, a lot of this stuff has to do with attention. When we rewire our brain, uh, so much of our cognition, so much of our uh, dealing with life is involved in paying attention to certain things and ignoring other things because our environment, our, our brains are bombarded with information all the time. And the use of games to actually focus that attention away from the negative things onto the positive things in your life uh, is something that I think is going to really hit a lot of these different um, problems. So I have some links. If anybody's interested, I'll, I'll leave this up for a while so you can take some pictures. Uh, there's a lot of information online about this. As I say, I, I, I can't predict for sure that uh, Achille will get their, their clearance, but I am very confident that even in the, the case that it doesn't happen, it's going to happen uh, with someone else very soon. And I think this is going to be a huge area. Uh, and I just uh, a, a final thing I'll say before I, I open up um, uh, some time for Q&A is that uh, I, this is really a lot of fun for me. Uh, it's, it's uh, you know, I love the games industry and I love the way that it does recreate and um, reinvent itself periodically. This is something that's interested me for many years, but as I showed you with some of those older games, uh, lots of times it was hard to get more than a few hundred thousand dollars perhaps to, to make a game. And uh, the testing scope, you know, one of the other things that I find that is really difficult for us as game developers to get used to is that if you raise a uh, million dollars to make one of these medical games, you have to count on using at least half, if not 60% of that, for just the testing phase, which you know, uh, some of the QA people are probably getting a little more excited about that now. Um, but the kind of testing you need to do with, with human beings for something that may have the potential for being a drug, it's really challenging. And there's a lot of uh, 
uh, work that needs to be done of figuring out how we do our work and how we have to translate it over to this medical side. You know, just as one example there, we're so used to tweaking games all the time and trying them out with our friends. Akili has, you know, I, I thought about bringing uh, their, their game to show to people here, but I've, I've talked to them and they're really cautious about this until they get their FDA clearance, because even though it's a video game, when you start making the case that this game has these, this potential to be so effective, you also have to uh, take into account the fact that it's a little bit like handing out pills to people. And uh, it's, it's interesting because I think with time we're going to see, you know, certainly uh, uh, we've, we've seen all these studies about games that uh, most of the time when people have said that they have terrible effects on, you know, people's behavior, it's been proven to be uh, totally groundless and, you know, I very much believe that's the case. But we're going to have more trouble making the case that games can't do anything to harm you if we also make the case that they're actually changing your brain structure and helping you in these ways. And it's a very interesting and difficult path that we're going to have to go down here, but I think it's going to be very satisfying for us. And I think most of you as game developers have had that experience of feeling games kind of rewiring you to learn how to play the game better. And for me, it's one of the most enjoyable things about games. Uh, you know, I think the process of learning is a big part of why we play games. You, you stop playing most games when you reach a point where you feel that there's nothing new to discover and nothing new to learn, and then somebody releases new levels or opens up a, a downloadable content, and suddenly you're interested again because there's new areas to explore and get into. And gets me back to my earlier metaphor, aside from making games that do that, our lives in the industry are, have to be based around finding these new areas to explore and interesting things to do. So a little bit of extra explanation there. And um, be, you know, uh, feel free to contact me. It's my main email address. Uh, and uh, there's a little bit more on my website. It uh, needs updating badly, but there's some uh, uh, inf interesting information for you there. And I'm happy, you know, send me a LinkedIn contact if possible, if you do that through their, their PC interface so you can actually add a note to me. I would appreciate it. And I wish they would change it so you could do that on mobile. But, you know, hey, that's Microsoft. Um, and I'll leave it at that and open it up to questions. Thank you. Got to be some questions here. Complex subject. Jen? Oh, I wait for the microphone, please. Um, one of the questions that we often hear in the United States is about whether or not video games cause gun violence. And given the progress that is being made in using video games for other mental health issues, how would you respond to that question? Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a tough one. Um, I think uh, the gun violence thing has been researched very carefully, and there's been a lot to show that it's, you know, the cause and effect is not there. It's not that people play a violent game and then go out and shoot people. It certainly seems to be the case that people who are predisposed for violence to begin with, like to go to violent movies, you know, read violent stories, play violent games. But, you know, we can't tell for sure until we do the testing. And as I've said, testing on all of these things tends to cost tens of millions of dollars to get really uh, effective results. Um, what I am encouraged by is that every time I've seen negative uh, uh, things attributed to video games, you know, guns being one of those things, but the idea that playing video games is rotting people's brains or, uh, you know, causing you to, to not be able to uh, cope with life in general, there are many counterexamples of positive ways that they're affecting our lives. Uh, something I didn't get into much in detail here is that another area of all of this is using games as training for doctors or caregivers. You know, I touched on it very briefly. But that's also an area that is receiving uh, funding in, uh, to the tune of tens of millions of dollars. And I think in general, like with so many other things, any new tool, any new technology tends to have both positive and negative effects. You know, the, the, the biggest uh, killer for a lot of people, you know, under the age of 30 is car accidents. And, you know, I, nobody wants to ban cars completely, but looking to ways to make them safer and safer over time is a high priority. And I think that games will be the same way, that the, the good far overweighs the bad, but that doesn't mean we ignore the bad. It means that we keep trying to improve it. 
other questions? Yeah, hi, thanks for your talk, really interesting. Uh, you mentioned that uh, FDA clearance takes like two or three years. Um, in your opinion, does it need to be changed? Maybe it's a waste of a time or uh, we don't need to rush in this industry and we need really need to do lots of tests. So in your opinion. Well, I, you know, I'm, I, I actually think they're, they're uh, process is, is surprisingly good. I, I started to learn about this and my sense was, oh, this is going to be, you know, sort of stodgy and terrible. But in fact, you have to realize that this is a, 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 a part of the government that for many, many years, there has been this huge pressure saying, look, here's a new drug. It may help with, you know, cancer or heart disease or something. I don't care if it has side effects. I want to take it right now. You know, I, I could die if I don't, you know, have something to treat this. And the reality, though, is that sometimes it's not effective at all. Sometimes it actually does more harm than good. Uh, sometimes it does good for a lot of people, but it turns out that if you have a certain genetic predisposition, then it's fatal. All of that stuff is very difficult to figure out, and you have to test with large, large numbers of people. Um, you know, as I mentioned, you know, over uh, 300, uh, like 350 or so for the Achille test, and that was a fairly average thing before they even get uh, the first level of clearance. And I think it's generally a good thing that they're as thorough as they are, but it's not the only way to go. Uh, particularly a lot of people, as I mentioned, Dr. Rodriguez, I uh, didn't talk about FDA clearance. You don't need um, FDA clearance to try stuff uh, if you don't make claims for it. It's like, well, this may or may not help with the pain, it, you know, we, we are confident that VR is not going to hurt them in any significant way. Let's just try it. And a lot of companies are doing that. It's much cheaper than having to go through the FDA thing. But of course, you also don't have all the advantages of doctor prescriptions and the, you know, the news about, uh, you know, it, it's, it's been big news for each of these companies that's gotten FDA clearance. So I'm, I'm actually pretty comfortable with it. And having been to Washington and met a lot of the people that are doing this sort of thing, it's, uh, you know, I, I don't often say this about the U.S. government, but I'm, I'm really impressed with, you know, how well they're actually handling this and the systems that they have in place. It, it helps, I think, that a lot of the people working for this are not doing it because, hey, I want to get rich, I'm going to go work making FDA clearances. They really want to help people in these really uh, important, significant ways, and it's great to see that, uh, you know, they're doing a good job with that. Um, Anything else? Yeah. Uh, you, you mentioned depression as an opportunity for games, which seems a gr great fit. Uh, do, do you know so, uh, some startups or, or someone working on this? Yeah. Um, well, depression is really intriguing for me. Uh, the Achille that I keep mentioning, it's certainly not the only company doing this, but they've, they've, uh, I've been involved, so I'm, I'm familiar with it. Uh, they did some tests using that same treatment game for uh, attention deficit disorder because they had an idea that it might actually help with depression. And there was an article published in one of the medical journals in January of this year that uh, showed some of their initial test results as being very positive. And that it turns out uh, that a lot of depression and this is, you know, again, I'm not a doctor, so I don't under understand all the details here, but a lot of it is involved with people kind of getting in mental loops of uh, life is, is terrible, I'm stuck in bed, I don't want to get up, you know, what's the point, nothing good ever happens to me, um, you know, look at how awful my life has been. And they have these kinds of chains going on in their head, and they just can't get out of that uh, uh, rut that way. And as I said, attention is at the heart of so much of this sort of thing, and it's really interesting to see that just being able to train their attention on this abstract game, in this particular case, it, and absolutely this is very non-scientific, but it's almost, if you think of the brain almost like muscles and exercising, uh, you, you, you have to be cautious that, you know, if you do a bunch of bicep curls, it's going to make your arm really strong. It's not going to do anything for your leg. And a lot of the brain training stuff, the problem has been that they focus on one thing and make claims about everything else. But attention seems to be one of those things that can unlock all sorts of other areas, including depression. So Achilles done a little bit of uh, published work on that. Uh, 
there are other companies, and I, I'm sorry I can't remember names right now, but if you look up depression and games, you will find a number of uh, people who've been experimenting with treatment. And in a lot of cases, using existing games that have nothing to do with depression. Um, but in a few cases, there are, in fact, games that have been aimed specifically at that, uh, usually done on a very small basis, usually uh, uh, you know, not getting a lot of press or attention so far. But it does seem to be a promising thing in the future. A couple of questions over here. Yeah. Hi there. Thanks uh, for your speech. It was very interesting. And uh, I have two questions, in fact. Uh, the first one is about the uh, neuro racer. Uh, what, were, what was the impact on the real life? Like, I can understand that the people were becoming better in playing the game. But uh, any game that is supposed to heal somebody is uh, mainly about this distraction, what I have seen. And it's my second question, how to treat the addiction to the games? Because mm, once you will uh, this, uh, replace the drugs with them, they will have the same impact. And we know, and I hear a lot of complaints from parents, even from the players. Hey, I'm addicted to this game, what should I do? So how to make the advantages gained through the game into their real life? A really interesting questions, thank. Well, the, the first one, uh, something we call transference, is actually at the heart of a lot of serious game work in that just because you do it in the game, does that actually transfer to real life? And the good news, actually, is that it's incredibly hard to get things to transfer. And that's good news because that's why I think violent games are not you know, creating a generation of killers. Uh, they, it, you play the game and you say, that's a game that's totally different. And I remember uh, cautioning my daughter at one point when she was playing Diablo 2 and she was, you know, getting into killing demons. And I said, you know, and, and she was basically, you know, hitting the button saying, die, die. And I said, you know, honey, you know, you have to be careful about that in school. And she says, dad, I know that school is not the same as a video game. And you know, this is the, the point, is that uh, we are pretty resilient in knowing that these things are separate. Um, and I'm encouraged by the fact that it's difficult to transfer. But to ask, answer your specific question about NeuroRacer, they did tests not to see whether somebody got better at playing the game. That was self-evident. But they actually did tests that are used for aging adults to see whether they can actually drive well. And that's, in my understanding, you know, is very concrete that way. And in a similar way with um, the attention deficit disorder, there are uh, tests that they give to kids to see whether they're able to concentrate and focus. That's how they, they can diagnose ADHD to begin with. And they can use those tests after people play the game and see whether there's a change in those tests that are independent and are measuring different types of behavior than what they're doing in the game. And as I said, it's been quite promising. And in a lot of cases, I have to admit, it's almost uh, too good to believe because it, it's been so effective. But I think games can be quite powerful. So to get to your other uh, question about addiction, um, this is a really interesting area. The game addiction, uh, I, there's a lot of controversy about it. Uh, I, again, disclaimers about having any you know, medical expertise on this. There certainly are some, some overall similarities between uh, playing a game and not being able to stop and things like gambling addiction that are not physiological like you know, taking an opioid, but are more of kind of a mental, you know, I, I'm doing this to the, the, the extent that it's actually impacting negatively on the rest of my life. Because um, I have people who want to play a game all night and just have a good time and don't have to get up the next morning, why not? You know, but uh, there was a great site called Sivanon.org, I think, that uh, uh, Microprose or Firaxis put up talking about the number of people that play Civilization and can't stop you know, one more turn. And they were making fun of it all because like a lot of positive things in life, it's great if you use it in moderation. It's not great if you use it to uh, an, uh, an extreme, um, you know, pastries and dessert. A lot of people struggle with uh, problems with obesity or diabetes. And uh, the answer, I think, is not to say we need to make all desserts taste terrible so that nobody's tempted to do that, but rather that we need to help people moderate their intake on those things. And I, I think that a similar thing is necessary for games, whether they are for medical treatment or just for fun. Uh, because a lot of stuff in life, 
if it's good, you may want to do it. If you do it to the excess that you can't, uh, that impacts the rest of your life, you need to look at that and work on it some way. Hugely complex subject out of the scope of what I can say now, but I do think we have to acknowledge that that's something we have to watch for. Uh, well, one last thing, actually, the Achilles game is actually purposefully really hard if we were just aiming at entertainment this game would be ratcheted way too difficult. But in order to get the kind of brain changes we need, turns out you need something that people have to really push hard for, or it's not going to start changing their, their biology. And uh, there's kind of a safety valve. It's the same thing that happens in all of us that, you know, we know exercise is good for us, but it's rare that people exercise to death because when your muscles are overstressed, they start hurting. And for most people, that's a feedback loop where they stop. And we have similar things, I think, with almost everything that we do because we've evolved to uh, uh, you know, not do it to excess. So maybe one last short question or maybe no? Maybe you guys can just uh, oh, come I'll over be happy to, to take you. it out. I'll yes. be outside and happy to talk to people more. Thank you very much. Thank you.